chance to uh, discuss this paper and talk about this literature. Um, about 10 years ago, I published a little book on the right to migrate in Catholic social teaching. And as part of that project, I had to summarize sort of the state of research on immigration and its effects. And one of the things I noted there was that there was a lot of, a ton of research on the effect of immigration on, uh, on native wages, on uh, fi public finances, but there wasn't very much research at all on the effect of immigration on immigrants, except uh, how, on, on their assimilation into, into countries. And, and uh, the assumption was that there were tremendous benefits to, to migrants. And uh, from the point of view of Catholic social teaching, I thought this would probably be the first thing that would be relevant. So it's good to see that there's research out there starting to be developed on just the magnitude of the benefits to migrants from migrating. So um, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about the paper. I, I uh, don't have a lot of time, uh, but I want to I come at it a little differently. I want to start with the perspective of Catholic social teaching and say, if I started from that perspective, what kind of questions would I ask? What kind of questions would this research answer? And what kind of questions would still be left open? Because right? this research answers some very important questions, and then I would like to talk about some other things as well. Okay, so uh, the reason we have to do this is that Catholic social teaching and economics, as we've seen, have very different approaches. So they're going to they're going to look for different things in the in the in the social order. Then they're going to ask a different set of questions or identify a different set of problems to to be answered. So in Catholic social teaching, you're going to be coming from the point of view of uh, human dignity first of all, and that's going to ground a right to migrate and uh, and the common good. You're going to want to know how that affects. Uh, the quality of community. And in economics, uh, this is a technical problem. where we, we put it in terms of productivity, and it becomes a problem of the allocation of productive goods, or produ of, of productive inputs, or the, the misallocation of those. And so the question is, how, um, how inefficient is the current allocation, and how might it be improved? How much money could be freed up if we just allocated labor properly across, uh, across states? So let's start with uh, Catholic social teaching just, just briefly and uh, talk about some of the, the concepts there, starting with human dignity, which we've already heard a little bit. Uh, we're made in the image of God, and so that endows each of us with a tremendous uh, human dignity that's, uh, that's expressed through our, our, uh, our, the agency in our own life, acting as a subject, making a decision, going to a new place, investing in ourselves and in our families. Right? And so uh, that grounds a right to migrate among the things that are necessary to allow people to manage their own destiny, to be agents of their own development, is the ability to move from one place to another if they judge that that's going to increase, uh, that's going to meet their goals. Uh, related to this is the preferential option for the poor. In particular, we're interested in the agency and the dignity of the poor. Because they're poor, there's more at stake. The trade-offs that they face, everyone faces trade-offs, but the trade-offs that the poor face involve more basic goods because their resources are lower. So when we see a poor person migrating, uh, our attention is greater to that person because there's more at stake. There's more uh, potentially being traded off uh, in, in that decision. Okay, and of course, when we, when we think about helping the poor, we'd like to help them in ways that preserve and enhance their dignity, allow them to become agents of their own, uh, of their own development. Now, related to this, um, this agency, it, it, it doesn't take place in a vacuum. It's not just individualistic because the person is social. Right? Um, we believe we're made in the image of God, and in Catholic theology, God is a, a trinity. God is a community as well. Right. And so, uh, uh, Benedict XVI says, a spiritual be man is a spiritual being, right, defined through interpersonal relations. Right. So we identify ourselves uh, by not only you know, by as Andy Yangert, but also as father, as co-worker, as friend. We're embedded in these social relationships, and our agency is embedded in those relationships as well. Um, I'm sorry, I don't think Russ is here. He could correct the, the butchery I'm going to do of some of the concepts that he uh, presented to us a couple years ago. Uh, he, he tried to organize our thinking about the common good to this group two years ago, um, where he made a distinction between the common good and common goods. The common good is uh, the intrinsic value of this common uh, action and the communion that arises in, this, in, this social, in these social groups, particularly the family. 
uh, in, in pursuit of these common, uh, common ends. Uh, it's something indivisible. Uh, his example was uh, a, a marriage is a common good. Uh, you, uh, if if uh, two married people go their separate ways, they don't each take half the marriage. Right? Something is individual, is intrinsic to their union together, to their, uh, their we-ness, their identification as a we instead of two individuals. And um, uh, the common good is not just something that two people decide, oh, I, I think this fits into my preferences. It's something that, that's integral to the way people live their lives and the way they pursue their goods in this sort of joint way that involves communion of persons. Now, of course, communities with a common good don't exist in a vacuum. They're usually organized around the pursuit of, of, uh, of what are called common goods, the things that, that are not, that, that are divisible, right? Common goods are things that are destined for private consumption, but they're distributed and pursued in this sort of communal way, right? Because people work for their families, people work as part of a larger community. In fact, it's part of the purpose of a community to organize our lives around these goods that we're pursuing together. And includes goods and services and income, and that's where the economics comes in. Right? So uh, the right to migrate in Catholic social teaching uh, sort of combines this concern about human dignity and agency with this social nature. If you, uh, it's based on three pillars in Catholic social teaching when you hear it described, uh, the right of a family to a living. Uh, the, the priority of the family over the state. The state exists for the purposes of the family and the right of economic initiatives. A lot of the language that's used there is the agency that's, that's already embedded in a community. People are migrating to, to provide for themselves and for their families. The right to migrate uh, is not absolute in Catholic social teaching. The, it, it is possible to abridge it, but uh, only if there are threats that uh, migration uh, makes to the common good. So even that, the, the, the restrictions on the right to migrate are, are in the context of community and common goods that, that migration may actually threaten. Right? So uh, typically this could be the culture of a community to which you're, commu uh, you're migrating to, or the public finances that may undergird certain common goods in the countries to which you're going. Right, but even the restrictions on, on migration are phrased in a communal way and so have this social aspect. I don't have one of those. So if I come at this from the point of view of Catholic social teaching, uh, I'm gonna start, wh what are my research concerns gonna be? I'm gonna start uh, thinking first of all about the, um, actually I'm a little ahead of myself there, the poor migrant, right? The person who's migrating is poor. Um, one, I, I'm attracted to that act of agency and I have to respect that. There's something important going on here when a poor person is picking up and moving across borders because only 3% of the world is moving from a place where, where, where they were born to another country. Um, I'm interested in what does that do to relieve material poverty of the poor and for their families. And what's the effect on, 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 the, on their community, on their families from migration? Right? Does it undermine it? Does it supplement it? And so on. I'm also interested in the poor who, do, who don't migrate. What's the effect of migration on those who are left behind, who are poor, and on those in the countries that you're coming to that are poor as well? So those are, those are the set of questions that I'm interested in. Uh, primarily, I'm interested in the effect of, uh, and, of the migration of the non-poor. Um, because it's an act of agency, uh, someone uh, thinking it's important in, in their life. I'm interested in, in the effect of that on community and the family of those who are, who are, who are moving. I wanna know what kind of support do they have? What kind of sacrifices are they making? I'm not as interested in the material effects there. Uh, the, usually, you know, these people who aren't poor usually can take care of themselves. I'm not, not as worried about what they may be giving up in, in migrating. Now I'm interested, in, of course, in the non-poor, non-migrant for the same reasons. I'd like to know what are the effects on the common goods of everybody who's not migrating, who's affected by migration. So starting here, um, the place of material goods in this and the economic goods here is, um, is sort of secondary. It's not unimportant uh, for that reason. But the, the paramount uh, interests of Catholic social teaching are going to be the effects of migration on family and community. In fact, a lot of what, if you read a lot of Catholic social teaching on, on migration, lots of, lots of it is just is, uh, very firmly expressed pastoral concerns. Are we meeting the needs of these people who are in new countries? Uh, what kind of support are they finding? What's happening to their families? 
Economic goods matter, but they matter instrumentally. That doesn't mean they're unimportant, but they're, they, they matter instrumentally. So we want to know, does a lack of material goods um, threaten the community and the family? And that's why people are moving. Uh, does the pursuit of goods through migration threaten family, threaten community? Uh, that's the lens that we're looking at this through. So now let's turn to the economics. Uh, so economics approaches this. It offers a framework for uh, thinking about the economic effects of migration um, and gives us some, some careful empirical work on these effects. Framework for analysis, as I've said before, is this uh, uh, as a technical problem, as a production problem, where you've got inputs, capital and labor spread across the globe, and we want to know if that allocation is efficient or if it could be improved. So the question is, is the current allocation of labor across uh, borders efficient? And uh, if it's inefficient, how much is at stake? Right? How many dollars are there on the sidewalk that we could just pick up uh, just by moving labor around? And we could improve world uh, output. Okay. So um, the primary evidence of inefficiency in an economic model is going to be some uh, difference in prices. And so the, the place premium, the wage premium across countries is, uh, is the primary evidence that there's something inefficient going on here. And this is from uh, the work that uh, John cites from, from uh, Clemens et al. of the World Bank, where they, they uh, estimate by uh, comparing people in the United States and uh, in sending countries, um, uh, large wage differentials between uh, developing countries um, and the uh, between the developed world and the emerging world for the same human capital skills. Um, uh, John uh, claims that there's less dispersion in the relative to return to capital. Um, I'm a little uh, less clear on that uh, uh, from, from what you cite and from the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the evidence you show. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about that, but perhaps we can talk about that on our own. But uh, th there certainly is a large wage differential uh, between uh, uh, the developed world and, and the emerging world. Um, and as a result, um, it looks like there, there should be tremendous gains from moving somebody from where his wage is low to where his wage is high. So for example, uh, the wage in Morocco from the data that he shows is 50% of US wages for the same skills. And the variable they use there, he uses is A. So the A for Morocco is 50%. Uh, and so the question is, why is it that if I take somebody out of Morocco and I drop him into the United States, his wages double? And if I take that same person and I take him out of the United States and I drop him into Morocco, his wages go down to 50%. Right? So uh, is that something about the worker or is that something about the place? Right? And the argument that's being made here and in other literature is that it's not the worker, it's not the human capital and the skills of the worker, it's something about the country. Right? It's a place premium. Um, if, and, uh, um, in, this, in, in this literature, there's this implicit assumption that if you're getting paid less, uh, it's because your productivity is less, right? Wages reflect productivity. Of course, that's, that's an assumption that we're making there. Um, so it must be that labor is less productive by 50% if they're getting paid 50% in, in, say, Morocco versus the United States. And all of this comes uh, under the... the, the uh, the theoretical uh, language of, of production. Right? The labor, there must be something labor augmenting in the United States uh, pr production uh, in, the, in the technology that's not there uh, in some of these other countries. Right? So it's not who you are, but it's where you work that matters. And that's, that, that, that's, uh, that's what we start with in this, in this literature. Now, um, so we, we start with uh, this A over here, which is uh, that, that wage gap between your country and the United States. And uh, what, what Kennan does very carefully is uh, he specifies a model in which that A does a lot of work in telling you what the gains would be from open borders. Right? And he spells out a very careful model, very carefully de uh, designed so that, that, that the gains somebody uh, has from, from migrating uh, capture most of the gains to the world economy from, from that migration. Right? And so uh, if you filter uh, uh, this A through his, uh, all the various assumptions he makes, and we don't need to go in, into all of them because he's specified a lot of them, you get a formula that he develops for, for uh, uh, specifying just how much the gain from migration would be in terms of uh, uh, developing country incomes, right? the workers and, and those who stayed behind. So under these assumptions, the wage differentials are... Um, uh, enough by themselves pretty much to calculate the efficiency gains from open borders. And, you, and, and as he reported, you get 125% gain in labor income in the developing world, right, just from having open borders. 
So um, he expresses, a, a, this is a, from the end of his paper, there are, these are of course just rough estimates, of course, uh, relying on a number of strong simplifying assumptions, but unless these assumptions are extremely far off the mark, the results indicate that gains from open borders would be enormous. Um, uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about this. It doesn't have to happen in every paper, but when you have these large exercises where you have a confluence of, of uh, very powerful assumptions, strong assumptions, it'd be nice to, to, to see somewhere where these are relaxed and what, it, what, what difference they would make. For example, if there was, um, if uh, a labor market in ascending country is less than competitive, let's say there was uh, market power on the demand side of that labor market, then the wage differential wouldn't necessarily reflect dif uh, differences in productivity. Right? And you might actually get uh, uh, immigration into the U.S. away from that lower wage may actually uh, increase the, uh, the inefficiency of the allocation if you're moving away from, say, a monopsony market. Uh, I, I'd like to see a little bit of that spelled out just so that we know what are the parameters, uh, what it would mean for an assumption to be extreme uh, that it might overturn some of these very large numbers. The numbers are so large that it's hard to believe that anything could overturn the basic result that there's a lot at stake in allowing for open borders. But it'd be nice to see a little bit more um, uh, on, on the robustness of, the, of these results. Uh, there are other effects, uh, um, uh, John doesn't go into them, and uh, the, uh, other, other parts of the literature do. The effect of uh, migration on uh, the country of origin, uh, what does it do to wages, human capital investment, inequality, uh, what, what happens, uh, the effects on the host country, there's a lot of work on that in the United States. Uh, most of the effects uh, on fiscal effects and effects on labor markets seem to be modest, at least compared to the large gains to the migrants themselves. So the summary, there seems to be a massive economic gain to the free movement of labor, much of which accrues to migrants. Um, and then, so the policy that John comes from this, uh, concludes from this is uh, open borders. Um, and uh, um, th this is from uh, the, the work from uh, the World Bank work from Clemens et al. Uh, that, that John cites. Uh, if you compare just allowing people to move from country to country to most anti-poverty programs, uh, the differences are, are very striking. So for example, uh, Clemens et al, they suggest, they, they compare the value of giving everybody in Bolivia an additional year of schooling. You increase their skills, increase their, their pay in Bolivia. If you, over, if you add up the value of an extra year of schooling over a lifetime working in Bolivia, you get about $2,200. Uh, if you take that person and, uh, and drop a, a person into the United States from Bolivia for one year, you get an extra $11,000, and that's just for one year. Right? So the differences are, are striking. Um, if, so you can think of migration as one of the most effective anti-poverty programs uh, in the world. And that doesn't even include the remittances that get sent back home directly to poor people oftentimes. And, um, I want to just end this with, 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 with another uh, a thought though, um, because um, although we know that people don't move because there are costs, um, it's, it's important to think about what those costs are, particularly from the point of view of Catholic social teaching. One of the things that keeps people in one place is the fact that there are social ties in that place. You're, you're pulling up sticks and you're moving somewhere away, away from family, away from culture. And uh, uh, that's what keeps people from, from moving. And so um, one question that would come out of that is why is it that people need to move? Now I can, we can see the differences. We understand why people do move. Uh, but th these movements do disrupt family. They disrupt culture and community. And so in some sense, migration is regrettable, even when we say, I, I don't blame them for migrating, and I'm glad that they can improve their material well-being so much. So this takes me back to this wage premium. Why does it matter so much where you work? Now, um, uh, since th this is done in the context of a model in which the difference is embedded in a production function, um, it seems that the difference, at least the, the difference is attributed to differences in technology or differences in production technology. That labor just happens to be, for whatever reason, more productive in the United States than in some other countries. Well, the crucial question there is why? And if, if it is just technology, if it is just something in a real production function, then uh, why is that not exportable? If there, if there are such huge gains, then why isn't there a demand for this technology in the developing world? 
Um, if it's something else, and particularly when we look at these macro production functions, it, uh, oftentimes we interpret them in terms of institutions. Right? There's something institutional that makes labor less productive in some countries than in the United States. Um, but what are those institutions? And if those institutions are actually uh, uh, market frictions or market imperfections, then does that, that has to lead us back to start reassessing some of the assumptions in this model that, that gave us that meaning to A um, as actual, uh, that we could interpret that as an increase in, in efficiency. Um, but but if, so if it's institutional, then the question is, um, uh, if, if we could solve the institutional problem, if we could actually uh, decrease that place premium, then people could get those gains without having to move. Now, the reason people are moving is that it seems a lot easier than trying to solve these institutional problems. But it brings us back to that, that, that um, the, the question of the institutional problems becomes uh, important to the extent that it would be nice if people did not have to move away from culture and family to get these sorts of gains. Okay, so uh, actually I think I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I'll say one, one, one more thing here. Um, uh, one question that, that uh, I'd like to see more of, and of course I'm sure there's a burgeoning literature on this that I'm unaware of, is um, what is the effect of, of migration on families and culture and community? Uh, there was a lot of speculation about that. It would be nice to see some more data on exactly what's being given up. Maybe there, is, you know, in some migrations you're moving from one family member to another family member. So there are communities in both places. Uh, it'd be nice to see more work on that. At least that, for coming from a Catholic perspective, that might be a, an, an intriguing question uh, for, for research. Last thing I want to say, and this is, I'm sorry on a different topic, but uh, for this audience I just have to uh, say it. Uh, you should buy my book. <laughs> uh, so. Um, I, um, I got sidetracked from a mainstream economic research by, a, by a, an interest in Catholic social teaching and all of the philosophical and theological uh, work that need, is needed to understand it. Um, so I still uh, love economics. Uh, I could give the talk that uh, Jesus gave earlier about, well, this is what economists do, and, um, and I, I appreciate the insights of economics. But uh, I've always been interested in sort of where, what, what economics can do, which I think is quite a bit astounding insights from it. And then, uh, but I think it's important to understand what it can't do. Because if, if, uh, if, 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 you, if, if economics is just a map, and we know we're leaving things out, um, if you never look at anything other than the map, then you're going to start thinking that everything really is the map, right? So uh, even something where you're involved in conversations with people who aren't economists, who are trying to explain to you and you're trying to explain to them, it opens up a, a larger world. And so this is just one of uh, an attempt at this. So talk to me about it. I might, uh, if I have enough funds, I'll even send you a copy of the book. Thank you.